All right, uh, gonna get started here. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, sticking out to the very, very end of this track, which uh, uh, continuing in the, the UCAN theme for uh, like two, two thirds of the day. Um, we're gonna talk about the interplanetary virtual machine conscious address compute for an open world. This is a work that builds on top of UCAN um, and uh, is, uh, Zishan, uh, my colleague, gave a talk about the implementation of this in a different track earlier today. Uh, this is more about the specs, standards, and uh, roadmap uh, for uh, IPVM. Um, Alan Perlis has this, this great quote uh, from uh, several decades ago, uh, which I think shows just how uh, universal and enduring a, a lot of these concepts are, right? The, the only universal in computing is the fetch execute cycle which we're gonna be talking uh, a fair bit about uh, here. My name is Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Xpeed. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CTO at Fission. Uh, you can find us on Discord or uh, the Protocol Labs Network, uh, Mastodon. Uh, and the past few months of my life have been uh, lived as a IPVM spec wrangler, uh, herding cats. Uh, it's not much, but it's an honest life, you know? Uh, and uh, hopefully today I'm gonna answer uh, these things. Um, people drop into my DMs like, you know, on a, a semi-regular basis asking, what's the status of the project? Uh, what's going on? What even is an IPVM? Uh, and so hopefully uh, I can answer all of these for you, plus uh, a few things that we've learned along the way. So this talk is brought to you by the IPVM Working Group, which is Yes, uh, you know, spearheaded by Fission, but uh, has had a significant effort from uh, Daghouse and Bakoyao, and also uh, some help from uh, Ceramic and Warforge. Yeah, so it's a whole, whole community, uh, community effort. Uh, timeline. Uh, so at the last IPFS thing in Reykjavik in July, uh, I uh, give a talk, basically pulling stuff out of the fission roadmap, saying like, hey, wouldn't it be interesting if we did some of these things? Uh, that spurred uh, a lot of discussion and people saying, well, yeah, you know, we need to work on the ABI and, you know, uh, uh, fuel metering and, you know, all, all of these things. And uh, it was very exciting. Uh, and then there were several months of just silence. Uh, we thought that we were going to be able to pull things further, uh, closer up in our, our roadmap, but unfortunately we had to uh, wrap some stuff up first. But then by the end of the year, uh, I, uh, this actual video of me going wild on the keyboard, um, uh, wrote a bunch of specs uh, to kick things off, um, and then did a couple of proof of concepts. Uh, first one was in, uh, actually in Bash, and it was surprisingly high fidelity. Uh, it worked shockingly well, considering how little code it was. Um, and then also a proof of concept in Rust. Uh, then early 2023, uh, Zishan got started on the Homestar implementation, uh, which is the uh, RS IPVM. Uh, so in the same way as GoIPFS became Kubo, RSIPVM is now Homestar. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, Specs v.2 um, went through another loop, uh, aligning with some stuff that uh, Daghouse uh, in particular are doing. Um, we ran a in-person workshop uh, in Vancouver, and then uh, here we are in Brussels at the next IP, uh, IPFS thing, uh, and hopefully we'll have uh, even more cats uh, hacking on keyboards soon. So what is an IPVM? The overall goal that we're aiming for is to have an open standard, almost like an HTTP equivalent, but for compute. So computation, like data, should be a ubiquitous commodity. It should be available to everyone, everywhere. If you wanna run it yourself, you can. Um, if you want to uh, pay for a hosted service, you should be able to, but you should also be able to move between services uh, completely transparently. Uh, you should be able to depend on having an execution environment around, right? So in the browser, we have Wasm. We have it on the desktop. Uh, we should be able to, in, in servers, we should be able to uh, pass that around and expect that to be there as part of our environment. It should be uh, fully consistent between clients, even if they don't uh, have all the same capabilities. So one of them might have a GPU, the other one might not, but they should be able to pass jobs around between each other to uh, essentially subcontract each other to do work. And it should be able to be a full replacement for something like AWS Lambda um, for uh, open protocols and nodes, right? So uh, 
that's not to say that Lambda couldn't participate if they really wanted to. Uh, it's totally open, uh, but you should be able to do the same sorts of things that you could do with uh, uh, Lambda. A lot of the way that people think about uh, compute is from an era when there was a, uh, a server rack in the corner and you could say it runs over there, right, and on the co-located co machine. These days we have really heterogeneous um, uh, network, right? And so we have uh, Filecoin and the FVM. We have people running um, uh, jobs right on their phone. Um, and we have uh, cloud and edge networks. Um, so like uh, Cloudflare, edge workers, you know, et cetera. And we need to be able to run uh, computation transparently across these different places, right? I should be able to run totally offline, you know, going through a tunnel, uh, stuff right on my phone, and then uh, if I need more power or access to some capability that I don't have, send that job off to somebody else, they can run it and return it to me. Or if there's, you know, uh, six petabytes of data, I don't have six petabytes of space on my phone, I need to be able to run that next to the data and have them return a the result to me. And this needs to be all permissionless. So instead of having a registry that says these are the things that we can do and nothing else, um, we are designing this so that uh, anyone can stand up and say, uh, I need to run a, whatever, a, a CUDA job or really take your pick and there's somebody who uh, is doing service providing, they could literally just you know, turn on uh, the spare cycles on their desktop and say, yeah, I, I can run these kinds of things and the network should be able to connect them to each other without having to, uh, without the network having to understand anything about the specific um, uh, uh, tasks that are being uh, passed around, right? So it should just be a discovery layer at that point and then both sides should understand how to actually execute and uh, uh, return results to each other. So we've been trying to get to compute at Fission for, 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 for a while. Um, and when we looked at it, uh, we want to get to compute. To do compute, you need data. And to do data in a production setting, you need to have auth. So uh, we built UCAN. On top of data, uh, we're, uh, for data, we're doing uh, IPFS. And on top of that, we've built a uh, web native file system so that we can do uh, permissioned access to data as well. And WebAssembly which is, uh, you know, runs on its own standards process and is uh, quickly becoming a standard basically everywhere. And with all of these combined, you get an IPVM, roughly. Uh, when we started looking at the specs for how to actually glue these parts together, we realized that a lot of it could actually be extracted out, and so you don't have to buy into the entire stack, right? If you just want the invocations, and we'll talk about what exactly that means in a few minutes, you can just pull that one part out. We found, for example, we wanted a, um, uh, signature, uh, generalized signature multi-format. Um, and so we actually pulled that out into its own spec rather than just baking it into the, the core where it actually originally started. So uh, specs to date, at least, um, you can core to power uh, actually transmitting around uh, access to particular resources. Um, IPLD WIT, we'll talk about that later. This is an ABI layer. Um, so Zishan did a bunch of work uh, to, to get that working, um, like, and actually in, in a very smooth manner. Um, and Varsig, so this is what I was just mentioning, uh, general uh, multi-format for signatures. Uh, we would have called it multi-sig, but unfortunately the name was already taken, so we've now called it uh, Varsig, and that lives in uh, the Chain Agnostic Standards Alliance. Um, we have UCAN Invocation, which does input addressing, execution, memoization, a bunch of that stuff, and it, the same spec actually includes uh, pipelines, which is call graphs, awaits, et cetera. Um, those are actually in the same spec. Today, they might get split out into their own separate ones. We have IPVM tasks, which is uh, around the computations. If you wanna say, I need um, you know, uh, a limit on how long this thing can run, or uh, fuel limits on WASM, things like that. You can configure the, the shell that's gonna run it, and workflows, which is uh, your transactions, error handling, defaults, things like that. Uh, there's one more part in here that we haven't built yet that we have uh, sort of you know, a napkin sketch uh, version of. Um, that's uh, payment channels on uh, UCAN. So that's both for actual payment, but also for um, uh, limiting access to any consumable resource. Um, and the, the running joke around is uh, UCAN channels or, or UCAN chan. So we'll probably have a, a cute little anime mascot, I assume. 
Uh, and we've had uh, a few people say like, well, you know, are you just trying to, you know, uh, use this to, uh, you know, block out all of the other possible uh, compute providers, et cetera? It's like, no, no, like, please get involved. This isn't to try to, you know, capture the market or something. We're trying to make everybody in the ecosystem better, right? This isn't one organization. This is a group effort. Um, uh, we're not competing with each other in the decentralized web space, right? We're going up against Amazon and Google and Microsoft, right? So, uh, and we are like tiny compared to them, so we need to band together and uh, we, by co cooperating, we can only benefit from each other, right? There's just so much um, uh, space for us all to play in. So let's actually look at how this uh, is structured. So this is uh, UCAN invocation. Ultimately, we want to pass arguments to uh, WebAssembly or potentially to, to other things, but today it's uh, all WebAssembly for now. Um, so we just have those two, great, and they're content addressed. And then we wrap those in a task, which has some of that uh, config that I was mentioning uh, earlier as well. There's a difference here between the reference and the actual invocation that uh, sometimes needs a little bit of explaining. So uh, using JavaScript as a, a rough uh, analogy, uh, I have a, um, a closure, so just an anonymous function that points to, um, uh, to an alert in this case. And if I just pass around the reference to that, I just say message, nothing happens until I actually put the brackets on it and then I get the, the alert, shows up. Uh, a more sort of classic uh, OCAP description of this would be if I give somebody, you know, why do we need this instead of just you can? Right? If I give somebody my car keys, that doesn't tell them what I want them to do with it, right? Like if we're, I hand the keys and they immediately get in the car and drive off, that may or may not be an appropriate thing to do, right? So there's a difference from here's the keys I'm leaving for the week versus like I need you to actually run this task for me, right? So these exist at separate layers. You embed a UCAN inside of this structure to authorize that something's going to happen if you need access to a resource. Um, and then this describes what I actually expect you to do with that. Once it's actually run, we attach it to a receipt, or rather the receipt points at this task. It includes the pure values that were output and any effects, that is to say any further tasks that I want to have on queued be put back into the system. And then uh, additional metadata, it might be a trace, um, uh, tags, things like that. Here's the actual IPLD schema. So at the bottom, is uh, what we're calling instruction, uh, used to be called a closure, and this contains the resource, so the URI, the ability, so these are directly from UCAN, any inputs it needs. Uh, so for WebAssembly, this will just be a, uh, a single string uh, key, that's uh, args and then uh, uh, array of the arguments, um, but could conceivably be anything, and uh, a nonce. So with deterministic wasm, uh, you can actually leave this blank, which is great, because anytime you run that, um, they're all equivalent. But if you were to say, update DNS or send an email, those may need to be unique invocations, and so they need to have this, because we uh, index everything based on this specific structure. Okay, and we'll talk more about that later. We wrap that in a task, and we point back uh, to the instruction in this run field. Invocation then adds the authorization uh, on top of that. So now it's actually been signed by the, um, by the uh, uh, invoker, by the one that's requesting this to actually be run. Um, and then that contains the other two. And we can have a bunch of these and wrap those up in a workflow. So we'll talk about workflows near the end. When you're building these, uh, how do you pass in the right arguments, right? So this is a question about ABI. Uh, we have in, uh, in IPLD, it's essentially roughly JSON um, plus a couple extra types. And this is the uh, WebAssembly component model types, this is uh, WIT. They're a little bit different um, and uh, WIT isn't actually done, right? It's still in flux, it's still changing a little bit. It's changing slower uh, and we've uh, talked to the, the folks at uh, the Bycode Alliance, it sounds like maybe end of this year, this will be actually done. Right now, the spec is empty uh, in, in their repo, um, but they've, they've done writing in, in other places. Uh, so we're just gonna keep it up to date with this stuff, so, but just 
you know, uh, caveats, uh, some of the underlying details here may change. Um, when we looked at this, we're like, well, we want to reuse as much as possible existing stuff happening in the Bicode Alliance, not having to write stuff ourselves so we can reuse all of that tooling. But these are very different types, right? In uh, IPLD, we have two numeric types. And in WIT, there's 10, right? So they're very different. But if you com uh, compile your module with the uh, component uh, tool chain, it creates uh, type definitions for you. And so uh, Zishan uh, went ahead and created a totally transparent um, uh, uh, translation layer, both on the way in and on the way out. So we get data back as, um, as WIT, and then we, when we, before we put the results back into um, IPFS, we convert them back into uh, IPLD. So the advantage of this is you don't have to think about, except for when you're compiling your WASM, you don't have to think about that layer at all. You, um, you just hand it essentially what looks like, I mean, I've inlined a few things here, but essentially what looks like uh, JSON uh, or CBOR or however you want to have that formatted, uh, and it'll do the translation for you under the, under the hood. Let's talk about Dataflow. Uh, Dataflow is, Pretty great. Uh, I think it's, it's too bad that we don't get to uh, work with it more often. Um, the guy who invented it uh, tried to, or he, he went to the, um, the lawyers at IBM and said, hey, like, you know, I just invented this thing, should I patent it? And they came back to him and said, like, well, this seems kind of more just like how nature works, so we can't actually patent it, right? Um, so uh, it's not that surprising that it shows up all over the place, but uh, really important for how we do things in IPVM because it's very distributed. And especially because there's an increasing amount of data uh, going onto these networks, right? We have a lot of data today, but as we're computing, we're going to be dumping more of that into this data store, including receipts that come out of this, um, out of this system, out of the, the computation. So there's additional metadata in addition to the data that's actually being operated on and updated. Um, so we need to be able to pass messages to where that data lives and have it execute there and return us results, at least just the, you know, the thin receipts as well. In order to do that, we need to be able to describe how, everything that should run over there, rather than waiting for a single thing and going back and forth, right? In order to do that, we also need to be able to transfer authority. This is part of where UCAN comes in. So uh, here's uh, Alice, she has a bunch of capabilities and she can delegate all of those to Bob and Bob can delegate you know, just some of this to Carol, who's gonna do some you know, service providing for him. And uh, this can also go in other directions as well. Um, so this could even be, say, Alice kicking off a job, and then the other four here collaborating to uh, uh, do which parts of the jobs that they can, and essentially uh, subcontracting out to others the bits that they can't do because they maybe are missing some hardware or missing a private key because they can't decrypt some data, et cetera. This breaks down roughly like this. This is a, a simple example. Uh, so we, when you pass uh, a bunch of invocations to a workflow, you don't, the order that you pass them doesn't matter. We just analyze the dependency graph and uh, produce, um, produce the graph from that, so we have a bunch of awaits in here. So uh, if you look at this one, uh, everything depends on the top. That data then flows down into uh, both of these uh, email sends, uh, and then at the end, uh, the bottom one awaits those other two, right? Um, we have a lot of flexibility now in how that actually gets run. So the scheduler, the distributed scheduler, has a lot of control over what happens from here. So we can break these up if it's, you know, if it makes sense to, to do this uh, based on, you know, how much load they're, um, they're handling, uh, if they have certain capabilities, you know, service discovery, all of this stuff. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, Alice is doing these first two, Bob does the other two, and the, the awaits actually go across the wire. Right? So you could run that entire sequence locally if you have the ability to do it, but if it needs to be broken up across multiple providers, uh, that happens automatically in the system. Um, and we've taken some degree of freedom away from the developer saying, no, you can't just put them in order unless you specify the dependencies between things. The upshot is that we can make really efficient use of the, the network as a whole. Those awaits um, are also in the schema. 
So they look like this. It's a, uh, a key value pair of a weight and then the branch that you care about, so either the okay or the error side. Or you can take either, and it'll include the, um, uh, the, the branch in the, in the result. That points out an instruction that it's awaiting, right? And so it's await okay, this CID. That will resolve into receipt, which will finish the await, which then means that another instruction has, um, you know, doesn't have awaits anymore, so it's all been inline, so that can execute now, which will produce more receipts, and we have this cycle of resolving, producing more receipts, and that's how we do the, actually working through the, um, uh, through the call graph. <laughs> On IPFS, we do um, content addressing, right? And so I have some content, like a nice Belgian waffle, um, and I just hash my waffle, and I get a key value pair, right? Here we have um, receipts, but I, I don't know what the output of it was, right? So I, I need to actually index it on the request for the job, right? So instead of hashing the receipt, because we don't know what that is, um, we hash the, uh, the description of the job instead. So this is called input addressing. Um, because of this, it actually has to live in a different DHT. Uh, so we're just composing this out of libpdp. It was actually uh, like, libpdp is amazing. So we, we uh, spun up Academia, uh, use these as keys, and it works really well. Um, you could potentially retrofit uh, the content addressing into uh, this new DHT because uh, one way of thinking about content as opposed to computation is it's like a function with no arguments. Right? It's just like, well, just give me the thing. It's just the identity function. You could do that. I, I don't know if that's uh, actually required. It's more of just a fun thought experiment. Because now we have the ability to look up results and to see if somebody else, anyone else on the network has run this before, when we're calling certain functions, certain WASM modules, um, we can look up and skip steps as needed. So as we go from uh, each component down this chain, we tap it and asynchronously um, do the WIT to IPLD conversion and dump it into IPFS so that it's actually happening in a separate process as we continue to execute the, uh, the WASM. So when you have composed WebAssembly modules, they uh, actually get stuck together, and we, uh, we haven't implemented this part yet, but uh, you put a, a thin shim in between that then um, basically redirects, copies the data and redirects it out into the separate process. The advantage is then uh, if I ask for um, this process again or the process crashed and I'm restarting, uh, I don't have to run that again. Uh, I can just grab that out of, uh, out of the DHT uh, and continue on um, computing. Uh, earlier today, uh, Zishan gave a demo of ex exactly this. Um, so uh, took a, um, a photo of a cat, and the first two steps of these two workflows are the same. So it was uh, crop the image and rotate it 90 degrees. Um, and I think he also crashed the process and, and restarted as well. But uh, so he ran this uh, top flow first uh, and then blurred the image. And then after that, uh, does crop rotate and grayscale. But because the crop rotate steps have already been done, it skips them completely and just does the grayscale. So you get this massive performance uh, improvement. Uh, because this goes over the network, uh, this could also be on another machine. So you might not even be aware that there's been a crop rotate done before. Uh, you just notice that things got really fast all of a sudden. When you're scaling up computation uh, to work on multiple processes, and you know, we have very, very high parallelism uh, you know, potentially in, in IPVM, what you want is to have this linear, um, uh, you know, if you don't have dependencies between data, you can get this linear improvement. As you add more computation uh, resources, you can, uh, you can go faster, right? Um, the commonly cited uh, limit to this is Amdahl's law, which says, you know, there's some coordination. It kind of, you know, you get less benefit as you go. There's only so much you can parallelize a task. In reality, what often happens is uh, the universal scaling law instead. So because you have incoherence and data contention, things like this, um, actually adding more parallelism can slow things down. Um, the good news is on the thing that we think is gonna be the by far the most used in IPVM, which is the deterministic subset of WASM, 
you don't have incoherence or data contention. You can run, uh, you don't have to wait for anybody to finish. If they're taking too long, you can just run another copy of it yourself if you think you can get it done faster. You can pull receipts that somebody else has run, even you know, raise them, and go faster, right? You can do this thing where the two, two of the three steps on the image uh, are shared, and you can just skip right over it. Uh, something that's uh, on the flight over here, uh, Timo's chatting about, that's kind of like an interesting accidental thing that's fallen out of the system, is that we get reverse lookup for free, because we've essentially built a reverse lookup DHT. I can go from a, a SID to its computed metadata. So I say the, uh, the resource is the uh, LLM, WASM, right? Um, its argument is a SID. I take that and say, well, what did you compute as metadata uh, out the other side? You know, was this a moderation classifier or an image classifier to say, here's a bunch of tags that you should add to it? Um, or uh, you know, do we want to check if a token, a UCAN, is valid? We can just go into uh, this DHT and say, hey, uh, how many receipts do I have for that? Okay, cool, there's, there's 10 people that have already checked this for me. I, I'm, I have a pretty good degree of confidence that this is actually gonna be a valid token. I don't have to go and pull all of them down and check the entire thing, right? Um, which is something that I've heard a lot of people actually talking about um, is this classification, how would we actually look up uh, the metadata um, this is one approach to it. There's probably generalizations to it as well, but it's just something that we get for free, which is kind of nice. Let's talk about safety. Um, people often, especially if they have a distributed systems background, uh, are worried about partial failure. We have workflows, there's lots of different things happening. Uh, what happens if part of it fails halfway through? So we've actually given this a fair bit of thought, uh, mostly coming from uh, thinking about software transactional memory, um, this great paper from Microsoft Research um, called Ambrosia uh, coins this term virtual resiliency, which allows you to write failure oblivious code, i.e. code that doesn't know that could have partial failure in it, run in a failure resistant manner, right? By limiting uh, to certain cases how you structure your, um, uh, structure your computation. The, the basic upshot of it is if you limit yourself to only having a mutation at the end, you can do as many uh, queries and um, uh, and just raw computation in the middle as you want, you get uh, essentially software transaction memory. You get transactions for free out of the system, which means that you can use all of the techniques from the database community, right? Um, and the developer no longer has to worry about the possibility of failure, right? Uh, the whole thing will get committed or not, just like a database transaction, but for arbitrary computation. I lied a little bit a moment ago when I said that it's queries and mutations, that's a simplification. The three properties that we actually care about are determinism, idempotency, and mutation. I'm gonna keep using query and mutation just to keep it simple because it's a half hour talk. Um, so we have a call graph that looks like this. So I've got a bunch of queries and then some computation, then another query, then some computation, and then at the end is a mutation. We can do this entire thing atomically and that will work. We can rerun big chunks of this until the mutation at the end. If we have something that looks more like this, where we have mutation layered throughout, uh, we can't have this be atomic anymore. So the plan for this is to say like, hey, you should really uh, add things uh, or structure things so that you have a single mutation. If you need to have several, that's fine. You're just gonna have to pass a force flag to it and say like, I understand, that's okay. Like there might be a partial failure in that case. The overall layout of this is we have queries and we have computation and those can cycle back and forth as much as they want. But we have to treat mutation in a very special way. There's a, I'm going, uh, kind of skipping over a little bit of detail here, but that's the basic idea. The other thing is when we have these call graphs, um, we can't just do a top sort on it and say, yeah, you know, like here's, here's roughly how they're laid out. We need to push the, the actual call of that mutation to the very end. Right? So it might not even have a dependency, but we're gonna leave that as long as possible. A related thing is doing uh, SID resolution. So there's a question when you have, uh, you involve things like slashing, who's, who's at fault when something can't be run? So we have a CID, we pass that to the process. It checks on the network, hey, can I actually resolve this thing? 
if the network says, yeah, no, I, I, can, I can totally do that. I'm not going to give you the whole thing right now, but like, yeah, I, I have that available. It converts it to a runtime type that is not expressible in IPLD called a content handle, or CHA, and passes that to the task. So this happens under the hood. Programmer doesn't need to know about it, but tasks don't accept CIDs. It doesn't know about them. It only accepts these handles that have already been checked by the runtime. Some stuff that we haven't gotten to, but that's sort of in the nearest term roadmap, is optimistic verification. So we already have receipts. We need to start comparing receipts to say, um, you know, I've had so many um, uh, confirmations of the same value. Um, I, uh, I got three receipts. One of them is differs. Uh, I need to go back and rerun that one step or check it against a uh, referee of some kind. We would really like to experiment with uh, zero-knowledge proofs for this stuff as well. Um, so one of the, the ZKP WASM um, systems would be uh, really great. We really wanted to have IPFS run working uh, before we got here. Uh, we kind of hacked it together, but uh, you know, doing a deeper integration uh, would be nice. So this is definitely very much on the roadmap still as well. And uh, decentralized WASM repositories. So uh, in, instead of having to always write your own WASM every single time, uh, putting this into a file system uh, and rooting that at a name, so it might be on NNS or on DNS link or somewhere, um, and saying, yeah, just you know, look at my repo and it's at this path, uh, gives you essentially package management. And then you can start composing workflows out of uh, well understood, already known uh, task types. So, Please join us. Uh, here is uh, the link to the community, um, which is a, a GitHub org. Uh, we do uh, monthly calls on Luma. So there's the link for the Luma as well. And uh, in the unconf, we have uh, two sessions uh, tomorrow uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. So the Rust template and Homestar uh, with Zishan, and then uh, everybody in uh, 2.30 as well. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, what are some of your early thoughts on uh, the security of the input based um, DHT? Um, because you're not actually, or you're storing outputs to an input CID, so you. Like how do you do? How do you know who to trust? I guess, in that sense, or are you assuming that like the you're only going to, going to be accepting um, receipts from people you trust? Yeah. Um, so there may be more than one receipt, so you can set a minimum number of confirmations that you need. So it's like I need a hundred confirmations. Um, you can uh, scope it down. Actually, the way it works today is it's scoped down to a subnet as well, so it's already in a trusted environment. Uh, we're going to open that up. Um, basically as soon, as soon as we can. Uh, we're just trying to get the system up and running first. Um, and a reputation score is, is the, the short answer in, in the longer term as well. Yeah. Um, when there's uh, like actual like long running tasks that take uh, uh, proper amounts of time, like more than, than scaling pictures or something, mm -hmm. um, are there ideas already around how a coordination between like worker nodes would happen so that they don't start the same task at the same time when it flows in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for things that are happening in uh, WASM, if there's uh, some degree of parallelism, that's actually not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, the process that kicks it off, it's not that you say like, hey, you know, who wants to pick this up and they just all run with it? Uh, it's all mediated by you can. And so you actually have a point to point saying like, hey, actually, yeah, I've agreed. Yeah, you run this and you run this and you run this. So you control your level of fan out. Yeah. This is great. Uh, I have a bunch of questions, so I will ask a few and then pause for others. Um, uh, for receipts, uh, it seems right now that the receipt is both um, addressing a competition that has terminated and addressing a competition that may or may not have started or that might be ongoing. Is that correct? Or uh, Receipts are uh, things that have terminated. Well, okay. I'll, so then why can't you address the receipt with just a CID? Like why do you need the, um, the uh, handle 
that is not the kind of like output of the computation? Is that just to, uh, to enable the lookup so that you can find the receipt? Yeah, exactly. It's to say, I have this job, and has somebody run it before? Is there an output for it? Yeah. Because I don't know what the output is. Yeah, got it. Uh, so it might be useful to have a separate type there, which is the kind of like handle to the, to the computation, whether or not it has terminated. And mm -hmm. that's the thing that you should place at the, um, at the, at the invocation, um, at the mutable invocation reference. Mm -hmm. uh, because some long running thing could signal that, and you can find, you can find the handle to the thing that may or may not be computing, and it might be a, a, a place to place other things like what nodes might be computing on this thing at a particular moment in time. Um, and then had another question around IPLD wet. Like, um, would it make sense to just make an IPLD codec that reads directly from wet, so you can just store wet as is without having to kind of convert back and forth? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. that's totally thing we could do. I'll pause for now. Good suggestions, though. Thanks. How do you think about work that is not fungible? If I have a job that wants to do something like read some weather data in Atlanta, and you go, oh, well, I scheduled in Boston, that may not solve your problem. Yeah, to totally. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of cases like this, right? Uh, uh, one example is um, email server for a certain email address, or uh, decrypt this data. So I actually didn't talk about decryption stuff at all. There's a layer about privacy as well. Um, so decrypt this data and operate on it, right? Yeah, there's lots of non-fungible resources. Yeah, right, there, there's huge, huge number of use cases for this. Um, that's done with, uh, and we didn't really talk about this either, uh, affinities, so to say, uh, you know, certain nodes have an affinity to run certain kinds of jobs, and you, they have to prove that they have those things. Yeah, uh, and other things in that realm of affinities could even be like, I have a GPU or not, right? So it's very common. Uh, we just haven't baked it in yet because it's just WASM today. Yep. It's not implemented yet, but it's, that's the plan. Yeah. Uh, the question is why the resource uh, is a URI and not just a CAD, because then it doesn't make the invocation um, fully deterministic if it's a resource that might be mutable? Yeah, so some, some resources are mutable, right? So uh, at the end of, uh, so we wanna enable things like read from DNS link, operate on it with deterministic wasm, write back into DNS link as an atomic transaction. So I need to then say the thing that I'm resolving is the DNS URI. Yeah, it, it might be useful to distinguish the, um, to create a different type there for things that are fully um, specified all the way down to immutable artifacts and things that may be mutable, because then um, it becomes really easy. Like Certain things become really nice and easy when you know that everything that you're pointing to is fully um, figured out, as opposed to you might have mutable ref in, in the same way that you have like these um, mutations that might occur, mm -hmm. um, if you have the ability to like just distinguish a call graph that is entirely deterministic from one that isn't. Yeah, uh, so we, we, we do that. Um, the, by looking at the resource type, like literally the schema and the, um, and the ability, we can tell in advance the safety level of that bit of computation. Uh, so things that are, uh, so it's, actually this is also a two of three, right? You can't have all three of these. Um, if it's deterministic and um, idempotent, it must be pure, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're in this totally safe, I can do whatever I want level. Um, we've worked it out because again, it's a two of three or you can even have one of them. And I think it's, uh, there's like eight or nine levels that map roughly to um, consistency levels, basically. Uh, and then that changes how the scheduler can interact with it. Yeah, got it. So, so then it's um, um, the, the program writing the invocation has to make sure that the uh, description is correctly matching the resource type. Yeah. And um, is there kind of like an, is it easy to enforce? Like I, I can imagine um, many cases where lying about that can get really bad for the computer that is trying to run the thing. Yeah, uh, so yeah, an example would be, um, this actually used to happen, right? Uh, having mutations happen on an HTTP get, that breaks the, the contract, right? Yeah. Uh, we don't have a strong solution for that other than a reputation system, they shouldn't do that. Yeah, um, and then on the um, on the traces for receipts, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is great to have 
the ability to have that. Mm -hmm. uh, that might want to be in the in some kind of handle instead, because you might want to be able to see the trace as it's occurring. Mm -hmm. um, so think of like a CI model where like you're you have a job and it's processing, and you mm -hmm. want to see the outputs as it's happening before it's sort of terminated. Right. Um, and so I don't know. Yeah. So would, would you do those as a DHT, or would you have that on say gossip stuff? Yeah, I, I would. I would probably just use the DHT for pointers, mm -hmm. um, like mutable references only, and then you then put everything else as um, mutable objects that you, in an append-only log. So mm -hmm. I would do it kind of like a git graph where you keep rolling up, and you just change the latest state of the head mm -hmm. in the in the DHT or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you could once you have identified who has this content, you can obviate the the call to the DHT entirely because you know who who are the parties that are running the computation, and you can just ask them uh, for, yeah. for the input. Yeah. What about uh, compute over data? And meaning specifically, do you have anything like affinity to the input data? So like, hey, I have a data set. Someone wants to do a computation over that specific data set. Mm -hmm. So therefore, let's make sure we target the code. Because the nice thing here is that IPVM lets you basically ship code really easily to different endpoints, right? Mm -hmm. So is there a plan to have like to model the actual affinity to the data itself? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So. Uh, essentially what the scheduler will do, it's not this sophisticated today, right? But it looks at the description of the thing that's being run and its inputs, um, asks, hey, like, who has this data? Is this nine terabytes of data, for example? Then, okay, I'm gonna try to schedule that with you if you can provide that to me, and it will win the, the bid for that job, basically, okay. yeah. Thank you. As a follow-up to what you just said, this uh, communication um, to kind of find out which node should run what and so on, mm -hmm. Um, is this like uh, like a pub sub protocol, or how are they, these nodes talking to each other? And and yeah, yeah. Uh, to take gossip sub, epi sub eventually, I, I assume. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can also do pre negotiation for some of this stuff. So one thing that I didn't mention in the payments layer, uh, or that was really just any any sort of consumable resource layer, um, is you could say uh, I prefer to run, you know, I've, I have a bunch of credits with this provider, and I want them to run a cron job for me every week, right? And so you can do that pre-negotiation, uh, and then it'll just kick off the process every week. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs>